Welcome everyone in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And yeah. happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out yes. there. It's, um, it's not Mother's Day in Canada, so you, you probably won't hear from any of your children for Mother's Day. Probably not. <laughs> no, not until May when it's Mother's Day in Canada. Uh, yeah. But happy Mother's Day to all of you moms out there. Yeah, we're going to go to a little video clip here to celebrate Mother's Day. This morning we're going to do something a little different for our prayer time. We're not going to have prayer points that are going to come up on the screen. Instead, I'm going to lead us all in a prayer today mm -hmm. for mothers. So today's Mother's Day. We want to acknowledge and pray for all the women that we know. Whether today is a day of celebration, a day of quiet reflection, or a day of healing, we want to honor you and thank God for you, for your strength, your wisdom, and your strong faith. So would you all join me as we pray for mothers. Father, we thank you for mothers. We thank you for the gift of family. Father, we acknowledge that the word mother stirs up different emotions in each of us. Today is a day of celebration for many of us. It's also a day that is difficult for many. Father, today we want to pray for women who long to be mothers and continue to struggle with infertility. We stand alongside these women and ask that you would fulfill the desire of their heart. Father, we thank you for women who have adopted children or are fostering children. We honor these women today for wanting to change the lives of children. Father, we think of mothers today who may have lost a child. As these moms reflect today, would they find you in the midst of their sorrow? For the mom whose child is lost to addiction or lost to the world, Father, would you fill them with hope and a perseverance to never give up praying, believing that you are the one who brings prodigals home? Father, we pray today for single moms we ask, Lord, that you would provide for them all that they need, for wisdom, for strength, for finances. Father, show us how we can support and encourage single moms. Father, we think today about all those who've lost their mom this past year. Fill them with joyful memories, we ask. We think of those who live with painful memories of their mom. 
Father, today would you bring healing and forgiveness into those places. For all the mums out there who are exhausted, trying to homeschool, work from home, feeling underappreciated for all they do, Father, would you strengthen them to do all that you have called them to do. Father, we thank you for the women in our lives who are spiritual mothers to us. Those who reflect Christ and are showing the next generation your goodness and your faithfulness. For all mothers and those yet to be mothers, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Well, I'm so glad that you could join us for the message today. Uh, we're going to jump right into the scriptures and begin reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. So read along with me as it comes up on the screen. Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than in what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but live for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Well, if you know me, you probably know that, that I love coffee. I love getting up in the morning and taking uh, coffee beans and putting them in my hand grinder and, and grinding the coffee in that fresh aroma of coffee. And I, I put that into a kind of cone filter on top of a mug and I take boiling water and I pour that into the filter. And that, that wonderful aroma just gets even more powerful. And then I end up with a, a, a brilliant cup of black coffee. And, and I love coffee. But one day, uh, a number of years back when we were living in Canada, uh, Andrea and I went to the market, local uh, farmer's market in town. And there'd be uh, a whole bunch of um, booths from different people. And one of those booths was from the tea farm. Now you can't grow tea in um, Duncan, the area we were from in, in Canada. It's a bit cold year round to do that. Uh, but um, this, this fellow named Victor, he had started to um, import tea and make different blends of tea. Now um, I'm, I'm not a big tea drinker, but Victor looked really interesting. And, and I thought, I'm, I'm going to go meet this guy. 
And so I started to talk with him and he started sharing about tea and he just lit up. I mean, he loves tea. And so he's telling me all about tea and, and how it mixes it, how you blend it and, and, and how you steep it. And he gave me samples of tea. He said, try this. And he described the, the flavors, the taste. And he was excited about tea. And, and I started to see Victor as a kind of tea evangelist. I said to him one day, I said, Victor, you're like a tea evangelist. And he just laughed because he, he just loved bringing tea to people, the message of tea, what tea is. And to use the language of uh, the scripture we, we read today, uh, he has a ministry of tea. He's an ambassador for tea. And, and Victor believes in tea. He loves tea. He wants to share tea. He carries the message of tea and he shares it with everybody. He wants people to enjoy tea as much as he enjoys tea. And, and I was, I, I bought right in. I, I purchased some tea. I went home, steeped it. I was drinking tea and I loved it. It was really wonderful. And Victor had that um, positive kind of influence on me. And I just wanted to, I wanted to love tea like Victor loves tea. I mean, I want to experience tea like Victor experiences tea. Well, Paul says that we are ministers of reconciliation, Christ's ambassadors. And we've been given the good news that it is possible to get right with God. It's possible to be reconciled to God. God has committed this message to us to bring to all people. Now, Victor was an inspiration. But our lives are fundamentally different than Victor's. I mean, no matter how passionate Victor is about tea, even if he was to make his whole life about tea, even if he gave everything he has to tea, the tea itself has no power to transform Victor's life. The, the tea is great and it's thoroughly enjoyable. And I, I think it has all sorts of physical and mental health benefits. It's really wonderful tea, but it can't transform your spirit and make you new. But reconciliation to God, getting right with God, can make you new. That's the promise of the Bible. In verse 17, it said, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Something very radical happens when we're made right with God. Something in our soul that even the best tea in the world couldn't make happen. Something changes in us. Being reconciled to God makes us new. It's, it's not a, a renovation of the old or taking something old and renovating it, but it's new creation, a fresh start, a new heart. That's the promise of scripture. And it's the promise and the message that we've been given. It, it is a powerful message. It has the power to bring real life change, to bring hope. To the hopeless and to, to bring courage to those who live in fear. Jesus said that that message has the power to bring abundant life. In John 10.10, 10, he says that, that this message can bring abundant life or life to the full, some translations say. Today, I want to explore what it means for us as individuals and as a church to be given the message and the ministry of reconciliation. So let's, let's have a look. First, I wanna start with the obvious. Every believer in Christ has been given the, the ministry and the message of reconciliation. God has entrusted us with the most amazing, most powerful message that this world has ever known. 
Listen to the, these verses again, 17 through 19. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. That's anyone. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself and given us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. That he was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. He's committed it to us, all of us. If anyone is in Christ, God has committed the message of reconciliation to every believer. And that means he's committed this life-changing message to you. The message and the ministry of reconciliation have been given to every believer in Christ. Now, one thing is clear. Jesus made it possible for us to be reconciled to God and gave us the job of helping others be reconciled to God. That's so clear in this passage that Jesus made it possible for us to be reconciled to God and gave us the job of helping others be reconciled to God. So whatever else we do as believers, and, and there are a lot of good things that we do as believers, a lot of good works, a lot of things that need to happen that the Bible calls us and tells us to do, but whatever else we do as believers, it seems pretty clear that God committed the message and the ministry of reconciliation to us and that we need to do everything we can to help others get right with God. That's, that's like our job description as Christians, as believers. We're ministers of reconciliation. Now, these verses don't, don't say some of you will be ministers of reconciliation. They don't say that some of you will help others get right with God. They say that all of us are given this ministry. All of this is from God, it says in verse 18, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And in verse 19, that, that God has committed to us the message of reconciliation. This ministry is for every believer. And it doesn't matter if you're an introvert or an extrovert, and I know that might just kind of mess with your head a bit, like what? But I'm not comfortable going out and talking to people and telling them about Jesus. And, and that's not exactly what these, these verses are saying. Uh, but they are saying that your life needs to interact with people who don't know Jesus, and you need to be prepared to tell them when the time is right. See, God's committed this message to all of us and to his church. The fact that so many Christians today don't take this message seriously, that it's their job to help others get reconciled to God, shows that there's something not right in our churches. And this isn't just your individual responsibility, although it is, and, and certainly it starts there. This is a ministry that that God's given to his church. So whatever else we do as a church, it seems pretty clear that this is the one thing we must do. We must equip every believer to be a minister of reconciliation. Now, I've heard people say during the lockdown, Oh, I can't wait until we can meet again in person as a church and get back to normal. Well, I want you to think that it, it is normal that every believer participates in the ministry of reconciliation. That is normal. 
So if your picture of normal was, well, part of being a, a Christian is I go to church Sunday, I read my Bible and I pray, but it didn't include that you have been given this message and this ministry of reconciliation and that that is part of what it means to be a believer and part of what it means to be the family of God, to be the church. If, if that wasn't your definition of normal, then it needs to change. I think our definition of normal needs to change. Every believer helping others get right with God, that's normal. That's the normal that we need to go back to. Well, there are many things that we do as a church and, and God's given us as a church many gifts. And all these things are important, but not if they distract us from the ministry that God has given to every one of us. You see, not if we use our service as an excuse for not helping others get right with God. If, if we say, you know, but, but um, my role in the church isn't to tell people about Jesus and how they can get right with God. No, I, you know, I, I serve in the background. I like to serve coffee or tea, or maybe I greet people at the door, or I'm part of a, a children's ministry or youth ministry, or I, I do these other things. There's lots of things that we are, are supposed to do as a church. But those are not to be an excuse for not bringing this message that God's given us. And we're gonna talk about how he's empowered us even to bring this message. Every believer has been given the message and the ministry of reconciliation. So what I wanna do is I wanna review the message. What is this message of reconciliation? Just in our verses here. Um, well, first of all, it's a message that we should know intimately. It's a message that, that is shaping our lives if we have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So we have this message in us already stirring and growing and teaching us. And, and the message goes like this. When we had no chance of being reconciled to God, of being right with God, verse 21 says, God made him who had no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God did this. God did it all. He made a way that we could be right with him, that we could be righteous or right with God. And the ultimate penalty of death was lifted off of our lives and it was put on to Jesus. We were set free from the burden of sin and death and restored to a right relationship with God. And then verses 18 and 19 say, and all, the, all of this is from God, this is what we call grace, who has reconciled us to himself and given us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world. This reconciliation is open to all the world, to all people, reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them, but bringing this incredible forgiveness for sin. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. God gave us his presence, his Holy Spirit to live in our lives and to shape us to be more like Jesus. We read earlier in 2 Corinthians that, that it's like the Spirit is writing God's story all over our lives for people to see. It's the amazing story of hope. It's an amazing story of life and God's writing it on us and using us and making us a pleasing aroma. And all of this is from God and it is for all who will come to him. Whatever else we do as a church, 
it seems pretty clear that our purpose has to be sharing the message of reconciliation with all people. Verse 14 says it's Christ's love that compels us to do this because we're convinced that Jesus died for all. And it goes on to say in verse 15, and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves. We've been transferred out of this kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of light and we get to live for the king so that we no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died for us and was raised again. Well, we bring the message of life to everyone who will listen. And and verse 16 says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. We don't look at people the same anymore because we've been transformed. And once we used to look at Jesus in this way and maybe cast him off, but now that we know the life that Jesus brings, we now look at everybody else as people who need that life and, and who we have the message of life and we have the ministry of reconciliation. And as we interact with them, and as God is at work in their lives, they will discover more and more about him. Now, you may feel totally inadequate to be Christ's ambassador, uh, to be a minister of reconciliation, but do you remember one of the organizing themes that we looked at for this, this whole letter of 2 Corinthians? That God's power is made perfect in our weakness. Let's remember that, that God's power is made perfect in our weakness. The truth is that we are weak. We cannot make anyone believe in this message, this incredible message. We can't do that. In our weakness, we don't have the ability to make others believe. But God is powerful and at work. And when we recognize our own weakness, we don't try to make others believe. We allow God to do that work. What we need to do is we need to be ministers of reconciliation. We need to bring the message. We need to tell people. We need to help them along the way so that they find out how it is they can be reconciled to God. And God has empowered us to do this. This is the good news that we're not on our own. It's God's power that's made made perfect in our weakness. And he's empowered us to be ministers of the message of reconciliation by transforming us, by actually the message living in us and, and transforming our lives. To begin with, he started by making us new. Remember, new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. He has made us new. We are new creation. Something massive has changed in us. And verse 17 said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. And then in verse 20, it says, therefore, we're Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. There's this new reality, new creation. The kingdom has come and it's a kingdom reality. And we're part of that new reality. We're more than messengers. We do more than carry a message. We embody the message. The message lives in us and is transforming us. It's making us. And then God makes his appeal through us. That's incredible that God would make his appeal through us, but he's making it through our transformed selves, our transformed living, our learning Jesus's words and ways and living them out. God's making his appeal through us. Now, here's a question for you. Do you believe that God can make his appeal through you? the new you, the transformed you. Do you believe that God can make his appeal through you? 
because that's what scripture says that you are Christ's ambassador appointed and sent by God every single one of us who are believers in Christ we're Christ's ambassadors empowered by him appointed and sent by him now imagine for a moment that um, I was appointed and sent to London as the Canadian ambassador and so I lived in Canada House. I don't know if they live there, but you know, in Canada House right on Trafalgar Square. And uh, imagine that as the Canadian ambassador, I refused to meet with any Londoners or anyone in the UK. I only met with Canadians. I wasn't gonna meet with anyone else. I just meet with Canadians. I wouldn't be much of an ambassador for Canada, would I? I think sometimes we're like that as Christians. We meet with lots of other Christians, but we're not meeting with those who we are sent to. We're Christ's ambassadors. We have this message of reconciliation. We are sent to people to tell them that they can be made right with God. That's who we are as the church. The church is not a building. The church is us, the sent people. And sometimes I think we get it confused. We, sometimes we think our church, our church building, is a witness to the town here in Cardigan, that our building is a witness to the town. But our building's not a witness. It's us. We are the witness. What we do in the building might be a witness. But we are the witness to the town. We are Christ's ambassadors. We're the ones who are sent. And we're sent to interact with people who don't yet know this message of reconciliation. And we're sent prepared to tell them that they can be right with God. You know, our, our Sunday gatherings, they're important. But for what purpose do we gather if we don't gather to equip each other to share the message of reconciliation. We're meant to gather and then go. This is the rhythm that the New Testament church is given, that we're to gather and go. We gather to encourage each other and equip each other. And then we go on Christ's behalf as his ambassadors and we implore people to be reconciled to God. It's verse 20. We implore you to be reconciled to God. We gather and get equipped to get built up, and then we go, and we go to implore people. Implore, the word actually means beg. I think what we do is we bring this such incredible message, and we make sure that people hear it. They choose, but we make sure they hear the message. The message that we are new creations in Christ, that something radical happens to us, and, and we no longer live for ourselves, but we live for Jesus. We've been reconciled to God, that we're experiencing new life in Christ. Well, I wanna end with a question that um, Cam Roxborough uh, asked in our last Forge missional training uh, session. And, and if you aren't aware of, of the Forge missional training that our leadership is doing, a number of other people in the church are doing, uh, it's an ongoing training that helps us to understand um, that God is a God of mission that he is on mission, it's his very nature. He is on mission and he invites us to join him in it. And the question that Cam asked, it was just near the end of the session um, this last week. He said, what would your town or village look like if Jesus moved in? What do you think Cardigan would look like if Jesus, came and moved into one of the neighborhoods? Or what do you think Aberporth would look like 
if Jesus moved in, or Kilgarren, or Newcastle Emlyn, or Krimmick, what would it look like? What impact would it have if Jesus moved into one of the homes in your neighborhood? We can just imagine, can't we? The impact that Jesus would have if he moved in to our neighborhood. Well, Jesus has moved in. He is fully present in his church. Uh, we have the message and the ministry of reconciliation, and we have the power of Christ to bring this good news to all, of, all people, to all people, all those around us. Jesus has moved in. What impact has it made on our community? Let's pray. Well, Father, first of all, we are so grateful that by your grace, you would make us new. That your word says the old is gone, the new has come. God, that you would do this transformative work in us. Oh, Father, we are so grateful that your love and your grace has captured our lives and that you are doing this incredible work. Father, we know it, it's not just for our sake, but it is for the sake of your kingdom and that you have given us a message and a ministry of reconciliation. And I pray, God, as your church, you will help us understand what that means and you will show us where you're at work and how we can join you. And you'll give us opportunities to share with all people that they can be right with God. Lord, bless us as your church, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're so glad that you joined us today. And we're hoping that you'll join us for Easter as well. Mm -hmm. Now, we've made the decision to be online this year for Easter. And I think that opens up some really amazing opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, go we're going to put together a digital invitation card, one that you can just easily send to somebody. And you can invite someone. They don't even have to live in the area <laughs> to come to the service. You can invite someone to that, that service. And it's going to be... Uh, really encouraging. It's, we're going to tell the stories of transformation of God because of the resurrected Jesus Christ can bring real life change to us. And there are going to be a couple of people that we're interviewing that share how God has made a real difference in their lives, uh, as well as we'll, we'll talk about the Easter story and why it's so important to us as, as believers. So uh, I hope you'll invite somebody that invitation uh, will be coming your way this, this week. Uh, as well as uh, we want to invite you to a sunrise prayer meeting. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you don't even have to get out of your pajamas because you'll be at home and you can be on Zoom. <clears throat> um, but uh, we're going to have um, the, the meetings hosted in, in each of the different areas or locations uh, around the church. So in Aberporth and Crimick and Newcastle Inland. And you'll, you'll be able to join with uh, whatever group is closest to you and pray for that area. We're going to do it at sunrise on Easter Sunday morning. Uh, so I hope you're up for it. It will be a really uh, important time of prayer for our church. Um, and we're also having a Good Friday service that will be on Zoom. That'll be more interactive than, uh, than our Sunday service on YouTube. So we would love for you to join that. That information's gone out already in the Friday notices, um, but there'll be more to come as well. Mm -hmm. Trusting that God will bless his church and, and bless those we're in contact with as uh, we celebrate Easter. Yeah. Well, church, now as you go into your week, um, may you be blessed as ministers of reconciliation, as you carry that message of reconciliation to all of those around you. Amen. Amen, church.